Great. So last week we saw that God is sovereign. God is the only one who is all powerful, all knowing, everywhere present. He has no equal. However, we saw that in this present age, the devil has been given a certain amount of spiritual power. And what God has called us to do, because we who are now in Christ have been taken out of, of the kingdom of, of, of darkness and brought into the kingdom of light, into God's kingdom, we've been enlisted into this battle, into this war that rages, a spiritual war that rages, we've been enlisted to resist, to stand against the enemy. And spiritual warfare is real. Spiritual warfare is something that we cannot ignore. Spiritual warfare is something that we need to, to grow in and we need to ask God to help us to understand better if we are to live the Christian life. The Christian life cannot be the true Christian life without spiritual warfare. And having been in Cape Town for this uh, leader's time, just realizing afresh that spiritual warfare actually happens in the context of God's mission. As the gospel is advancing, as churches are being planted, as non-believers come to faith in Christ, as strongholds are demolished, as lives are transformed with the truth of God's power, that's the context of spiritual warfare. And, and we're called to, to resist. We saw from, from James chapter four last week, James four verse seven, I won't go into it now in terms of the, the fuller context, but the word there is resist the devil and he will flee from you. We are called to resist the devil that he will flee from us. And, and this morning we're going to continue looking at what does it mean, what does it look like to resist. And what I'd like us to do is to see that resisting involves the Word of God and the Spirit of God. That we resist with God's Spirit and we resist with God's Word. The Christian life is both Word and Spirit. It's not just Word and it's not just Spirit. Similarly, when it comes to the area of spiritual warfare, it is word and spirit. And we see this in the life of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you, you have a Bible with you on your phone or an old-fashioned paper one, please open your Bible. The, the verses will also be up, taken from the book of Luke, chapter 4. And this is what it says. Jesus full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Next slide. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. Hang on, back to that slide. Back to that slide, please. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Next slide. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. 
For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist in the River Jordan. And at the time of his baptism, the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form. At the time of his baptism, there was a voice from heaven which said, you are my son whom I love in you I am well pleased. So this is, this is a moment in the Bible where God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are together at the time of Jesus' baptism. And Jesus is, is from there led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And he's led by the Spirit into the wilderness for what purpose? He goes there and he is tempted by the devil. Matthew has the same account. Matthew tells us, that the tempter, the devil, came to tempt him during his time in the wilderness. So here is Jesus. He's about to begin his mission to save the world. He's about to declare the kingdom of God and, and perform signs and wonders and heal the sick and, and change lives and challenge the religious order. But before that, there's this time of preparation. And in his time of preparation, before he goes out, the devil comes to tempt him. The temptation is in the context of his mission. How does Jesus respond? Quite simply, Jesus resists. He resists the devil. And how does he resist? Well, firstly, Jesus is full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had the Holy Spirit fill him at the time of his baptism. And it is the Holy Spirit that led him into the wilderness. When Jesus faced the devil... He was not on his own. Can we go a couple of slides down? Next one. Next one. Next one. Verses one and two. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. Jesus was not alone. The Holy Spirit was with him. If we turn to the Gospel of John, In John chapter 14, Jesus is he's preparing his disciples for his departure. And he says to his disciples, I'm going to my father's house. I'm going to prepare a place for you there. I'll come back. And as he's preparing his disciples for his departure, and you can imagine how how tough that must have been for these guys. They'd been with Jesus three years and it was good. I mean, sometimes he rebuked them. Sometimes he, you know, he was a bit hard on them. But that's, you know, that's relationship. He was trying to help them grow in character and prepare them for what was to come. But now he's come to the point where he's saying, guys, actually, I am, I am going to leave you. But as he tells them that he's going to leave them, he also tells them about the Holy Spirit. 
And he says to them, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. The spirit of truth will be their advocate. He will be their defender. He will speak on their behalf. He will be their helper. He will be the one that draws alongside them and helps them. Unlike the world that doesn't know the spirit of truth, they know the spirit of truth. They have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will not only live with them, the Holy Spirit will also be in them. And at the end of John 14, Jesus says, the prince of this world is coming. So I'm leaving. The Holy Spirit will come and help you. The prince of this world is coming. The devil. We saw that last week that one of the names of the devil is the prince of this world. So as I leave, the Holy Spirit is coming. That enemy, the devil is coming, but you will have the Holy Spirit to help you. You will have the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to fight in this battle, to resist in this battle. If we are to resist the devil the way Jesus resisted the devil, we need the Holy Spirit. We need him in us so that this this flesh, which is so easily tempted by the devil, so that this flesh doesn't have the final say. The flesh wars against the spirit. It's It it wants to do everything contrary to the Spirit of God. It wants to take you down that, that path of temptation. But if we have the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can help us. The fruit of the Spirit, Lord, give me self control. Lord, give me faithfulness. Lord, give me patience. Lord, give me love. The Holy Spirit helps us. When the tempter comes, we we need the Holy Spirit because the devil wants to take us on the wrong path. He wants to lead us astray. But the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth, so he will lead us down the right path, the path of truth. Dear friends, if if, if our Christian life is, is void of a relationship with the Holy Spirit then we are not fully armed for spiritual warfare. We must cultivate this relationship. How do we do that? Well, how did you cultivate the relationship with your girlfriend or your child or your husband or wife or your brother or sister? You spend time together. We need to get into a habit of saying, Holy Spirit, I I, I just want to spend time with you. I want to speak to you. I want to hear from you. I want you to show me what the Bible is saying so that I understand it. I'm going to ask you for help in this area and that area. It's a relationship. It's not a mechanical to-do list. It's a relationship. So we, 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 the, the Holy Spirit draws alongside. He comes to help us. He comes to live in us. That's intimate. That's relationship. And all of us can, can learn. You know, you, if, you, if you aren't in that habit, well, begin to take some steps. It's a few minutes a day. Holy Spirit, I'm here. I want to hear from you. I'm just going to speak to you. Can we speak to the Holy Spirit? He's fully God. Yes, we can speak to the Holy Spirit.
Jesus resisted in the power of the Spirit and he resisted with the word of God. With each temptation from the devil, Jesus quoted an Old Testament piece of scripture. In, in Jesus' day, they, they didn't have... Um, They, they didn't have the whole Bible. This, this incredible, amazing word of God wasn't complete as it is in our day. They had the Old Testament. So, so what Jesus does is Jesus makes reference to his Bible, which is the Old Testament. And, and as, the, as, the, as the devil tempts him, what does Jesus do? He says, it is written. As the devil tempts him again, what does Jesus do? He says, it is written. As the devil, it is written. Jesus knew the word of God. Jesus memorized scripture. And, and dear friends, just to be clear that the temptation that Jesus was facing was real temptation. When, when he made reference to the Bible, when he made reference to these Old Testament passages, he really was being tempted because Jesus, while being 100% God, he came from heaven. He was also 100% human. Now, I know that math doesn't quite add up. That's God. He's not limited to our, our adding up. Jesus was fully God. In him, the fullness of God dwelt. But Jesus was also fully man. And that's why as he's, as he's, he's being tempted, he'd been fasting. He'd been fasting. And, and, and fasting means that, well, his, his body was weak. He was vulnerable. In his humanity, the devil came to him at a time of vulnerability. So when Jesus quotes the Bible, he's doing it as one who was fully human. In as much as yes, he was also fully God. And can I fully explain that to you? Can I fully understand that in my own limited mind? No. But it's true. Leon Morris, he's a New Testament scholar from Australia. He said this, the Bible was the only book Jesus ever quoted. And then never as a basis for discussion, but to decide the point at issue. Jesus quoted the Bible. And if we are going to be able to resist the devil like he did, we need to know the Bible. The first temptation that Jesus faced had to do with his physical need of food, with hunger. A very basic need, especially if you've been fasting. So the devil comes and what does he say to Jesus? If you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. When, when the devil says, if you are the son of God, it's not as though the devil doubts that Jesus is the son of God. He knows he's the son of God. The Bible tells us that demons submit to the name of Jesus. He knows he's the son of God. He's, he, he's like saying, well, show me that you are the son of God. And Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 8. And the context there is Moses is reminding the Israelites of their wilderness experience. And Moses is telling the, the, the Israelites, guys, God humbled you through the wilderness 
and he fed you so that you may know that man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes out of the mouth of God. So here is Jesus going through a wilderness experience of his own, where he has humbled himself before God in fasting, where he is facing a tough time, where he has submitted himself, led by the Spirit into that context, and the devil wants to come and disrupt that. And Jesus says, no, I know what the Word of God says. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. I think that if we look at our own lives, the temptation to take shortcuts with material needs is a real temptation. The temptation to take shortcuts with daily bread, our day-to-day -day needs, it's, it's a real temptation that the devil still uses even today. And just thinking of the, the economic situation that we, we find ourselves in Tanzania today, where, where the economy is, it's been going through a tough time. Can you imagine that the kind of temptations that both Christians and non-Christians are facing in this area? And, and the devil would love to come and, 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 and say, hey, listen, here's a shortcut. I have a way for you. Or take things into your own hands. Yet, in God's sovereignty, God is saying, actually, I, I, I want you to trust me. I want you to know that you don't live by bread alone. I want you to put your faith in me, and I'm going to work this thing out if you trust me. Jesus had the word of God in memory, so he could, he could coat it. He could... Resist by recalling God's word from memory. And if we are going to resist the devil, we, we need to be able to, to do the same thing. I have, I'm full of God's word. A, a situation comes of temptation. I can resist with the word of God. One of the areas where I, I know the devil tempts me, an area of vulnerability, is in being anxious. I get anxious about the future. I get anxious about my children. I get anxious about whether we'll, you know, we'll have enough money in the future. Like, wow, you're a pastor, you're not supposed to get anxious. Yes, I live by faith. I hold on to God's promises. But I'm also human. But I've had to, to come to a place where I need to obey the word of God. When Jesus says in, 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 in Matthew chapter 6, do not worry, I need to obey that. And one of my favorite passages when it comes to this issue of anxiety and worry, it's Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, where it says, do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving make your requests known to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And I've had to memorize that as, as a weapon for my life. And, and sometimes I forget it and I have to go back and re-memorize it and remind myself of what it says. But I have to be able to say, it is written. This is what it says. It's not about my feelings. It's not about my flesh. It's not about my lack of faith. It's about what is written. The second temptation had to do with 
power. But this power that, that the devil was offering to Jesus was power that he would obtain by exchanging his relationship with God with the relationship with the devil. Instead of, of, of paying, of giving himself to worshiping God, what was the devil saying? Worship me. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written. Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He quotes Deuteronomy chapter 6. Serve only God. And if we read further in Deuteronomy 6, it talks about how God is a jealous God. He's not going to com allow other gods to, to compete with Him. He's, he wants absolute supremacy over our lives. It's God and nothing else. Now, is it true that the devil could have actually given Jesus all the kingdoms of the world? To some degree, it must be true because the Bible speaks of the spiritual authority that, that, that the devil had. Jesus himself called him the prince of this world. He's called the God of this age. So while God is absolutely sovereign in control of all things in this present age, there the is real spiritual power over this world that the devil yields. So certainly to some degree, that would be true. And Jesus has come into this world in humility, as a servant, in obscurity. The temptation for power which he laid down in heaven. He left the splendor, glory, and majesty of heaven. He lays that down. This temptation in his humanity would have been a real temptation. But what does he do? He says, no. It's very clear that there is to be only one God. Only one God is to be worshipped. Only one God is to be served. And this temptation for, 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 for idolatry... To, to exchange God for something else in the, in the hope that we'll get some benefit. That temptation is there in the world today. There are all kinds of idols, idols that set themselves up in our hearts, all kinds of things that we make more important than God, thinking that somehow that we, we will have something better in this world. The temptation for power is real. Maybe... Maybe for you, it's in your workplace. You want more power in the workplace. Maybe it's in your family. Family's broken, things are not going well. There's an opportunity maybe there to ex exercise authority, take advantage of your family. You want power in your family. Maybe it's in the church. You want power in the church. Who knows what area? There's that temptation in your heart for power. That temptation is real. We must resist it. We must look to Christ who said, I'm going to humbly serve God alone. I'm going to come as a servant. I've come to give my life, to lay my life down, even to the point of death on the cross so that your sins might be forgiven. Jesus came to serve God, preaching the kingdom of God, healing the sick, delivering the oppressed. He came to serve, not for authority and splendor. He came to die on a cross. If he had exchanged that mission for the enemy's temptation, he would not have fulfilled his mission. 
But he goes back to the scriptures. He goes back to the word of God and he says, this is what the word of God says and I'm going to hold on to it. Last week, we saw that the devil did not want to keep his proper position of authority. That the devil rebelled because he wasn't happy with the position of authority that God had given him. He wanted more. And he will tempt us in the same way and say, hey, listen, that, that position you have, mm -mm. hey, find a way to get more and I can help you. But if, if, if I'm going to help you, you need to stop following God's way, follow my way. We can get it together. And the Bible says, no, it is written, Worship God alone. Serve Him alone. The third temptation has to do with the devil asking Jesus to do something like really dramatic. Like throw yourself from, from the top of, of the temple. And did you notice that, that the devil quotes the Bible? He goes to, it is written. <laughs> Jesus has said, it is written, it is written. Okay, the devil doesn't really have a lot of new strategies. He's a, he's a counterfeit. So he sees that Jesus has been saying, it is written. Well, I'm also going to say it is written. So he quotes Psalm 91, a great psalm about God's protection. And I remember when, when Trudy... Uh, led us as a family, said, hey guys, as a family with the kids, we're going to memorize this psalm. We need to know this psalm as a fortress of God's protection. But when, when the devil quotes Psalm 91, does he really want Jesus to jump down and the angels to save him? Because the devil is a liar, he's a deceiver, he's a destroyer. All he comes to do is twist and corrupt he probably made that quote hoping something bad would happen. He did not have Jesus' good intentions in mind. But what does Jesus say? Jesus resists by saying, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This would have been a test. This would have been like, hey, I'm going to show off. I'm going to show that I have this great God on my side and do something dramatic. No, that's, that's not the faith we're called to live. Here is Jesus learning humility. Here is Jesus learning to depend on God. Here is Jesus learning to put himself at the feet of God and prepare himself. And here comes the devil say, hey, do something dramatic. No, I'm not going to put the Lord to the test because I need to learn to fully submit to his will because come the time of going to the cross, I could do something dramatic. I could call all the angels of heaven but no, I need to learn that I need to trust Him for everything, in everything. What's the end result? Well, after the three temptations, we're told that the devil left Jesus. Jesus had successfully resisted we can also resist the devil to the point where he will leave us resist the devil and he will flee from you it says that the devil left jesus until an opportune time this means that the devil was going to come back at a time when he thought Jesus was again vulnerable to his attack. And the same applies to us. We will resist and resist and resist. The devil will flee, but he will come back at an opportune time. So in the meantime, what do we do? Well, we fortify ourselves with the Word of God. We grow in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. It's like... It's like Arnold Schwarzenegger's movies. One of his famous lines was, I'll be back. Yeah, he'll be back. 
In the meantime, what are we doing? We're preparing. We're getting ready for the next battle in the war. Last weekend, we had a session for, for the men in the church to learn how to read the Bible. And it was a great session. Mark did a fantastic job. And the turnout was, was okay. Honestly, I, 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 I wished more of us men could have come. I know it's a Saturday, but men... If we are going to be serious about spiritual warfare, we need to know how to handle the Word of God. So next time we, we put on something like this, please, please show up. I know sometimes we've traveled or there's sickness, totally. But outside of a really key issue, please show up. And I hope that our ladies will also do something similar where they can also keep growing in, in, in learning the word of God and how to handle God's word. The devil is a deceiver and he is an accuser. So much of the devil's attack against us will come in the form of lies that he wants us to believe. He wanted Jesus to believe that worshiping him was better than worshiping God. That's deception. He wanted Jesus to think that he was not doing enough to show that he was the son of God. That's the kind of subtle accusation that's trying to deceive Christ. But Jesus was, he was secure in who he was as a child of God. His father at his baptism had just affirmed him, you are my son, I love you, I'm pleased with you. He was secure in who he was. And Jesus was full of the spirit, he was full of the word, he was immovable. So yes, there was a fight on, but Jesus was ready. So it needs to be the same for us. Deception and accusation work in our minds, when we get thoughts that we're, I'm not sure of that thought. Where, where did that come from? We need to examine those thoughts against the word of God. We need to ask the spirit of truth to lead us into examining those thoughts against the word of God. And the more dependent we are on the word of God and the spirit of God, the better we will be at resisting the devil. Now as, as I come to a close, a question that, that comes up from this passage, and this answers both ways. There isn't like total agreement in the, in the body of Christ on this. And, and I think that's great because uh, while in Cape Town, again, we were, we were taught that, you know, there are some things that are like blood issues that we as Christians really, really need to believe, like Jesus rose from the dead, that the Trinity, God, is really three persons in one, one God, but three persons. Those kind of things, those are blood issues. And if we don't believe those, mm, are we really Christians? Are we really a church? Then there's kind of ink issues. These are big deal issues, you know, that you write them in ink. They, they are a big deal. And if you're going to be part of us, it's important, like baptism. That's an ink issue for us. But then there's also like pencil issues as well. Like, ah, if we, if we don't agree on that, is that such, is that, is that really a train smash? And, and I, I'm not sure this question I'm about to pose is a, is a blood issue. I don't think it's a blood issue. It might not even be an ink issue. But it's still an issue. And the issue is this. Can Christians speak to the devil? Some will say, hey, 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 whoa, don't ever speak to the devil. You have no authority to speak to the devil. Some Christians speak to the devil every single day. 
morning till night, they are speaking to the devil. So it's like there's a polarization. And it's, it's interesting that we can speak to the devil all day because the devil is not like God who is everywhere present. He's actually gonna be at some specific place as you're speaking to him. But anyway, um, so, so that's the question. And I, I think that as we look at the fact that we're supposed to follow in Jesus' example, I think we can in moments where the Holy Spirit shows us that this is actually a demonic thing, this is of the devil, as we discern that through the Bible and through the leading of the Holy Spirit, we can speak to the enemy. We can make reference to God's word and say, it is written. In fact, in, in Matthew's account, Jesus says, away with me, Satan. So, so we can resist the devil, and away with me, Satan is resisting, isn't it? It's, we can resist the devil by making reference to the scriptures. Albert Barnes, who's an American theologian, he said, we are to meet the temptations of Satan as the Savior did, with the plain and positive declarations of scripture. And I would say the plain, positive declarations of Scripture as we are full of the Holy Spirit. So here is my challenge to us today. Dear friends, let's get a plan to read the Bible. There's lots of plans you can, you can get on your phone. You can, you can download different apps, but have some kind of plan to read the Bible and get into the habit of reading the Bible every day for some time. Get a plan to memorize the Bible. Get yourself full of the Word of God. Get a plan to spend some time each day with the Holy Spirit. And if we do that, we will grow in how we are able to stand against the schemes of the evil one. Shall we pray?